I started, uh, uh, I come from a classical Indian middle class family, uh, wanted to join Indian Army, decided uh, to, uh, the Army didn't like me that much and so I was forced into uh, something called Indian Institute of Forest Management, uh, which was quite an interesting place. Uh, my first job was in a forest. Uh, I chased bear and was chased by elephants for three, three and a half years. And then uh, I got married and my wife wanted me to actually find an alternate career. So I went to IIM Ahmedabad to do research and then uh, uh, stumbled into an opportunity to set up probably India's first incubator in 1997 for government of Gujarat. Uh, my job was to convert farmers' ideas into businesses and uh, while doing so, I realized that uh, if you really need to change or make a difference to rural India, uh, ideas were dime a dozen, but capital and talent was really missing. So with this brilliant idea, and just to give you an idea, I became a CEO when I was 26 years old. So, uh, so I was not mature enough to understand the challenges. Uh, I was too naive to understand the depth of uh, the complications that I would need to face to bring about change. And uh, when I conceptualized that uh, capital and talent are the two real missing pieces in rural India, uh, I tried to convince my board to listen to my great idea of taking capital and talent to rural India. Uh, they were wiser, smarter and had seen more of the world. And so I was advised that uh, the questions that I use, you are raising are valid, but they are not going to be easy to execute on. So why don't you continue to focus on converting farmers' ideas into business using all the instruments of power that has been vested in you, power being part of the government. Uh, I think uh, when you are 29, uh, when you are a forester and you have limited experience, uh, you can be very brave, uh, which can also be seen as stupidity by some people. I quit my job uh, and decided to launch a fund called Avishka uh, with roughly 5,000 rupees of capital that translates at that point of time in the exchange rates $100 uh, and then borrowed 1 lakh rupees to start a company called IntelliCap to fulfill my great dream of putting together uh, capital and talent and that's how I started. Now having cleared this background. Uh, uh, I would like to try to tell you what I, how am I going to frame my discussion. Uh, so I'll try to tell you about my experiences and my learnings of last 20 years, uh, just so that you understand when I started in 2001, uh, the idea, the thought process of impact investing did not exist. The term impact investing got coined in 2008. Some 10 or 15 of us got together. Uh, uh, of course, uh, on the invite of Rockefeller Foundation to find a nomenclature that represent all of us. Uh, uh, our history started around the same time I started. So the idea of impact investing in the true sense of the word with intentionality started in 2001. Avishkar was one of the pioneers, but so was Acumen in US and I think Bridges Venture in, uh, in UK. And uh, it's quite funny, but all of us started at the turn of century in 2001. So, so interesting coincidence in that sense. Uh, there are a lot of people who claim that they started much earlier in impact investing, but most of these people were making impact like Reliance or Tata's or anybody else make. And yes, the fact of the matter is anybody who does a business, 99% of them do make impact. So the big question starts is, is therefore impact, impact investing something unique? And uh, that debate will probably never end. So I will ignore that. And I'll come down to my personal experience. So I've been around uh, doing what you consider impact investing and what, what so eloquently before me, uh, Professor Jazeed Singh had explained uh, about the features, the challenges, the idea of impact and how you measure. Uh, my first learning, and I think uh, Jazeed also alluded to it, is uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So, and unfortunately, therefore, good intention does not lead to real impact. Uh, he gave a very beautiful idea and so uh, example of how these challenges work, uh, but sufficient to say that just because you have the right intention, uh, you will be able to make impact is highly challenging and debatable. Uh, the second thing, I have all my life spent uh, the effort uh, by using equity as an instrument of impact investing. Now in India, uh, far more than the world, uh, equity is seen as the real impact investing tool uh, rather than development impact bonds and social impact bonds, which are actually later innovations, but very important innovations, no, no doubt. 
my personal learning over last 19 years is equity is a very important but a limited instrument. It's a very good instrument, but it's a limited instrument. However, without equity, uh, you will not be able to create enterprises that have uh, the desire to make impact. And so while it is a limited instrument, it actually creates significant dilution, challenges the ownership of the idea by the entrepreneur. It still is a very important and critical instrument. I do genuinely believe debt plays a very large role and therefore I believe, and this is, uh, this is a position that I have taken in all global forums, that India's priority sector lending is probably the world's largest impact platform uh, and impact forum, which makes probably the sign most significant amount of debt available to those who are making impact on the ground. Uh, now, of course, it does not get seen as impact investing, but it is really one of the largest debt programs on impact. Uh, bonds are important, largely probably in uh, very different kinds of situations than the for-profit impact investing. Uh, and over time, and I have been a convert in this sense, over time I have believed that uh, the power of technology to imagine making a difference uh, is amazing. And therefore, what was not possible and therefore people are left out of making impact can be done with the imagination that technology allows, uh, the, with the imagination that technology will make it happen. So you can imagine how to make a difference in the lives of the people, but you cannot execute on them because of logistical, physical, and human challenges. Uh, with technology, you can actually bypass a lot of them. And therefore, technology is one of the biggest deliverer of impact on the ground. I think one of the most ignored aspect of impact investing, uh, which probably is the reason why a lot of people fail, is the complete lack of focus on building the surrounding ecosystem for impact. Silicon Valley is not Silicon Valley because uh, money or talent is there. It provides an ecosystem that actually has an end-to-end -end services so that capital can focus on taking risk, talent can focus on creating the solutions that would deliver returns, and then there are everything else that is there in a very closed environment to make a difference. Broken ecosystems are the biggest challenge that most impact investors will face, and so does impact entrepreneurs. I think uh, I'll make a controversial statement here. Impact measurement is important, but creating impact is far more important. So yes, measurement is important. It's a very strong Western thinking that you must measure everything, otherwise it does not get done. I genuinely do not believe that's true, uh, but it is important. However, I would still spend every penny that I have in making or creating impact rather than measuring it. Uh, and that's what we believe in. It does not mean that Avishkar does not measure what impact is or is not open to allowing others to measure it. But if I have one dollar, I would actually rather spend one rupee, one dollar. I would rather spend in creating impact rather than spending my time measuring it. And my final and the most important point on this key introductions on myths around impact investing. Impact investing was never conceptualized as an alternate to philanthropy. This is a myth that has been perpetuated for long, and I want to bust this myth. It was designed as an alternate to mainstream investing. We were not really fighting for few billion dollars that go into impact investing, uh, so, sorry, in philanthropy. We were not fighting to try to make some small amounts of concessions coming from corporate social responsibility amounts. The idea of impact investing was to challenge the hegemony of capital. It was the idea to challenge greed. It was the idea to conceptually re-christen the world it is. Unfortunately, the academic world has completely missed the point. And therefore, a significant amount of effort is made in comparing impact investing with philanthropy. First, impact investing is not designed to challenge philanthropy because philanthropy requires to feed a hungry child in any part of the world. No impact investing instrument has been designed to serve that need. And so therefore, I would very strongly urge people to not compare or see impact investing as an alternate to philanthropy. We are neither designed nor have the capability to solve that challenge. Uh, philanthropy has its, a very important role to play and impact investing role is to challenge the greed and hopefully make the world focus on the idea of creating a sustainable change. Now, with these opening points, I will try to get into something uh, real and physical. Uh, so I've given you a lot of philosophy behind how I think. Uh, but then some of you would ask, Vineet, you are an impact investor. What is the difference between you and a venture capital fund or a private equity fund? Uh, let me try to actually elucidate from my point of view. You may disagree with it. That's fine. But uh, let me tell you what I think. 
The most critical difference is that as an impact investor, I am trying to solve a complex social problem by finding an entrepreneur who has figured it out to do this profitably. And most likely this entrepreneur is operating in a broken ecosystem. This is really what an impact investor is. What is a venture capitalist? A venture capital investor, on the other hand, is creating value by filling a want gap in an evolved ecosystem to achieve a disproportionate return. So he or she is taking a very large amount of risk and is seeking a disproportionate return. Generally focused toward want because the wallet size of the money that is coming out from the pocket of the person becomes a very critical determinant for the decision for somebody to put in significant capital behind an idea. In our case, we are trying to look for a complex social problem as a solution. Now, the moment you actually start articulating yourself in this manner, and I'll give you three examples of why some of the problems and challenges that uh, Professor Jasjeet actually alluded to will, can be very easily and profoundly ignored uh, if you actually start with this premise. So the first question that you can start with asking, and I'll give you an example. Uh, there was an example probably about what kind of farmers were using fair, uh, fair, uh, fair trade uh, benefits and largely going to large farmers because it's natural large farmers will benefit anything that is actually good for farmers. Uh, now let's take an example. In India, in Bihar, uh, you have, so everybody knows India has a fragmented land ownership. Everybody also knows that uh, UP, Bihar, Charkhand, Orissa forms into the complex uh, low income states in India, Bihar probably really below or at the lowest end of the spectrum. Uh, very small, very, very rich uh, land, land, land holdings, value of the land holding, the quality of production, uh, the access to water, everything brilliant. Very small land holdings, extremely abysmal productivity. Uh, more importantly, significant wastage. Now, if you want to actually create value for the poorest farmer, what do you do? And there are many different ways to do it. You can provide them inputs, you can provide, help them with directives on how to improve productivity. Uh, but then you actually realize even if you improve productivity, the farmer still sells desperately. Why do the farmer sells desperately? Because the moment the crop is ready for harvesting, the farmer knows there is no place to store. And why does farmers don't have a place to store? It is not because there are no warehouses in Bihar. There are warehouses in Bihar, but they have been designed at 20,000 tons. Now, 20,000 tons is a very large space and a farmer in India will produce what, five grain, five bags of grain, 10 grain bags of grain, 20 bags of grain. Uh, how do you actually fill a warehouse of 20,000 tons if you are supplying less than 10 tons or 15 tons or 20 tons to store? Uh, so nobody is really interested and these warehouses therefore are designed in a manner that they are close to the buyer. So they would actually see where is the buyer and they will try to put it so the traders who will go to the villages and they will buy the grain and then bring and store it here. So person with capital at the point of time of the harvest and the farmer has already spent everything they had in creating the crop, they want capital. Now how do you solve this? So a local Bihari young guy comes to me and says, I will create 200 ton and 500 ton go-downs right inside the villages. I will not spend money in trying to build the village uh, in the warehouses because that will reduce the returns. I will actually create these warehouses as if these are banks. I will encourage a senior uh, villager to who has some capital to take a loan and build this warehouse. I will run it in the best potential possible manner. And I will digitize every bag of grain so that I can even accept one bag of grain to be stored here. And digitizing will allow me to use all the warehouses. So I'll create hundreds and 200 warehouses of 200, 500 tons so that I reach 50,000, 1 lakh tons, 100,000 tons in capacity. And I will use the ability of digitization to treat the grain like cash. So when you go to a bank and you give your cash to deposit, when you go and to take out the cash back, it's not necessarily that the notes that you give in while giving in, you will get the same notes out. Similarly, he wanted to digitize grain. Now, this is a solution uh, backed by a very strong partnership with non-banking finance company to finance the farmer the moment they come and deposit the grain up to 70 percent of the value of the grain on that day essentially solves two problems one creates storage b actually provides farmer the capital and three actually allows this guy to trade on the farmer's grain to create returns which are roughly 40 percent to 70 percent higher 
than what the farmer was gaining on a six monthly basis. Now that's actually what you call real innovation in a broken ecosystem that is solving a complex social problem. Just to give you another example, uh, I was driving around in India. I have, I have a bad habit of driving across India. So I drive from Mumbai, Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai, Bangalore. Uh, and when I'm driving around, I see you pass through Devnar and you see almost a Mount Everest of dump. Then you go to Delhi, you drive past Ghazipur, you see again a mountain of dump. And I used to say in 2011, 12, and 13 to my partner Ajay Maniar that Ajay, there we are actually seeing these landfills, especially becoming mountains. There must be a solution to these problems. We started looking around and we realized that in India, all waste management is called lifting and shifting, which means government actually essentially gives a contract. So municipality will come with a contract. People will apply, these guys will then send trucks, they will collect the waste, both wet and dry, and then they will go and dump into something called a landfill. Unfortunately, the landfills were filled and they were now actually dumping it on a Mount Everest, creating a Mount Everest out there. Now, this was what is called waste management in India. Now, we said, okay, let's look for a solution that can create wealth from waste. It is not that these guys who are doing lifting and shifting were not creating wealth but they were creating wealth by putting the waste in a certain manner that was creating health hazards, an eyesore and a challenge. And we said, can we find entrepreneurs who can convert the waste into wealth and in the process, not working with the government or selling to the government. So the government should not be a buyer. Uh, we came across two young guys who were effectively acting like kabadis, uh, buying from the rack pickers and doing it in a very ethical fashion. We gave them a small amount of capital, three crore rupees. They tried to scale this business up. Uh, the easiest thing you can do with money is buy a lot of waste. What is more difficult is convert waste into money. They were doing dry waste management and recycling. Uh, it, so the, the moment they got three crores of money, they bought a lot and lot of waste. Uh, that waste got, uh, got collected in one place. So it moved from the waste dump to their uh, storehouse places. And because it was dry, uh, there was a fire and all my three crore or a large percentage of that three crore became three kgs of ash. Uh, learning from there, the idea was good. The intent was great. Uh, the idea to solve the problem was right, but we were missing out on using technology because the, what they were doing at a small scale, they were doing 50, 100, 200 kgs can be done with human intervention. But the moment you get into thousands of hundreds of tons, or tons and tons, not even hundred of cent. At that point of time, we were talking about five to ten tons. You require a very different engagement. Uh, just to, uh, I mean, I actually met the entrepreneurs again. We discussed how do you solve this problem. They came up with a new idea, which needed a very complex technological solution. That technological solution required us to invest another twelve crore rupees. I invested that twelve crore rupees, not knowing after losing my first three crores, and that's what made us an impact investor. Taking extraordinary high risk after burning our capital to go and ahead so go ahead and invest again in an unknown solution in a broken ecosystem and that's really what impact investing is i'm just giving you an example and uh, lo and behold uh, these guys went from few hundred kgs to 15 tons then to 30 tons then to 40 tons and uh, the story of fires happened in 2014 we are in 2020 uh, just to make you aware of what this, this company now does 1000 tons per day and it is probably going to be India's first waste unicorn uh, in the fastest potential possible time. They employ and engage thousands of rag pickers into their supply chain. Uh, most of these guys who are from the poorest of the poor background comes from migrants from the villages and this is the lowest possible job are now actually proper blue collar worker wearing a dress and uh, working in a very highly uh, specialized plants set up by this company. Again, the two same young guys. Uh, we have since, ten, since then invested more than 120, 160 crores in this company. And uh, we are hoping that there is a lot more investors from across the globe. Now this pro solution is not just uh, a solution for India, even though I'll actually just give you an idea that we are at 1000 tons and we can take it to around 2 lakh tons within India. And a 100 ton roughly gives you a 250, 200 odd, 100 tons actually gives you a 100 crore turnover. So on a thumb rule basis, you are talking about a company that could be as large as Uber in a fairly short period of time. The demand far outstrips our ability to supply. These are just two examples of uh, the kind of challenges and solutions uh, that impact investors need to solve. Another key difference of being an impact investor is when a proposal comes in, you actually don't salivate at the idea of returns. You first challenge yourself, 
does it make solve the complex social problem and can i justify that this problem is complex enough for this guy to solve and for us to invest in back that's called an impact screening process and until unless you do that you will not be able to actually go past to the commercial diligence so which is very very different from a conventional investor who's trying to maximize returns that the, because the only thing they will ask for what is the scale what is the wallet size of the person who is spending the money and what is your strategy to acquire that wallet size that's it uh, in our case you have to first justify how do you actually enter and finally uh, i as a impact investor hand on my heart might make a claim that uh, my absolute return might match a commercial return but once you adjust me to risk i will always be below uh, venture investors risk appetite in terms so on a risk adjusted basis impact investor will find it impossible to compete with mainstream investing even though on absolute terms we might uh i will very quickly touch on two points that really really matter a lot to me who owns the impact and i think uh, there is a lot of discussion around impact measurement but there is uh, and there is professor jaisi is actually also alluded towards the idea of impact and who owns it i actually genuinely believe uh, no impact investor own the impact of the enterprise because it's not our idea we are not the ones working on it so just because i am putting money and owning a certain percentage of that company my ownership of that impact the attribution of that impact to me is really flawed that thought process again uh, and i am not going to mince my words is a very western thought process trying to actually attribute everything to somebody Uh, just because you have invested capital our belief is uh, the impact investors impact is what how did they find the entrepreneur what kind of idea they backed what kind of risk they took what kind of a broken ecosystem they challenged themselves with how did they resolve all other challenges what kind of governance they brought in did they actually look at first generation entrepreneur did they look at a women entrepreneur did they created a governance mechanism that was transparent honest uh, so those are the things that we believe is the impact investors uh, impact not uh, what happened on the ground uh, i would also like to say that an impact investor can never be right uh, change is the only constant the world has to offer a great idea in 2007 is not a great idea in 2017 with time the theory of impact changes the aspirations of people change and what was right will keep changing So this is a treadmill on which you run a long distance, but you not necessarily reach the end very fast. And finally, and I think this is a most ignored term, impact is contextual. What is impact to somebody sitting in New York is very different from what is impact to somebody sitting in Switzerland is very different from something somebody sitting in Mumbai and is very different for somebody a farmer sitting in a remote village in Bihar. I think the idea of context in the con in the context of impact itself uh, is very very crucial. The lack of understanding of this leads to creation of these bad case studies that you also heard about, uh, and the lack of understanding. So this flying thirty thousand kilometers and doing investing to make impact uh, is probably the most out of context thing I have ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, we keep seeing that happen again and again and again. Uh, again, your vision of impact is not necessarily the vision of impact for the person who's actually you are trying to impact so this is a very complex situation uh, and i keep saying it that what i see as impact is very different from what the beneficiary sees as impact and i'll just conclude this argument with this example i was told all my life as a young child that rich rich people are not really good people they try to take away resources etc they don't have a large heart they don't like to share the poor likes to share and that's what i was told all through uh, and therefore poor are good people but when i was in my forest and i actually met very poor people people who are willing to die uh, starve to death but not willing to beg i asked them what do you want to be in unanimously every poor person wanted to be rich and funnily and they were good guys so all the good guys wanted to become bad guys and i have never come across this uh, conundrum i have never been able to resolve this conundrum or the context is why did indian society kept telling me that rich are bad and poor are good when all poor wanted to be rich and uh, i think a lot of us suffer from that problem the government suffers from that very serious problem as well uh, the western societies don't but uh, especially indian society and a lot of uh, developing societies suffer from this problem a lot of this is because we associate richness with corruption and uh, poor utilization of the power 
Uh, I will stop here because I think uh, I have spoken for far too long. I would like to actually engage, uh, engage with the audience in case you want to engage with me. Uh, there's a lot I can talk about from social stock exchange to sustainable development goals, my own theory of where the world is going over the next decade, which I believe is going to be a very reformative decade. Uh, the world has imagined by 2030 that uh, impact invest, uh, the sustainable development goals will be implemented. That means no hunger, no poverty, no inequity. Now that kind of a vision uh, was conceived five years back, but COVID as a disruption has completely wiped out all the work done from 2000 to 2020. Uh, 350 to 500 million people losing for formal jobs, uh, 1.4 billion people who actually have uh, in the informal economy have been seeing a fairly serious uh, destruction of uh, uh, job creation or livelihood creation for them. Uh, extreme poverty growing at a pace that is never seen in the world for last 50, 100, 200 years. So we are in for very challenging times uh, and I personally believe impact investing is probably the really rightly identified tool for the future. Uh, those who are in the space of impact investing will start seeing uh, a mandate change in the world of capital. There will be a lot of people in the world of capital who have seen the decimation of wealth that COVID has brought to and are therefore far more amenable to the idea of a sustainable world. <music>